Let me ask you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. That's all you need to know, Romans chapter 8. But I would like for us to begin with the word of prayer. God, as we come to this part of worship, I would ask that you would give me strength and ability to speak clearly and effectively and truly according to your word. That your people would be encouraged and blessed by the things that we will read and the things that we will contemplate. And I would ask also that you would help every one of us to understand and realize that when the Holy Spirit convicts us, it is for our ultimate good and your glory. So God, may you do your work, please, during this time through the Holy Spirit with me and for your people and those who may hear later. For it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. The title of this morning's message, the first time, was prayer, getting blood off our hands. I modified that to prayer, keeping blood off our hands. I wanted it to be different. If that seems to be an unusual title, I will remind you of what we read last week from Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 18. Listen to what it's written. God is the one speaking and he says, If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hands. Now right behind that, I want to read our text for today from Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. There Paul writes under the inspiration of the Spirit to the believers at Rome, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Now he's talking about his brothers and sisters of, of Jewish descent. Now, when I contemplated Ezekiel 3 last week and during this week, I realized, that, and this is going to be kind of a, a dumb moment, that I did not want to stand before God with bloody hands. That means that I do not want to be held accountable and responsible for being led by God to share the gospel about Jesus Christ and not doing it. For then I will be held accountable. The way to not have bloody hands is to tell unbelievers, the wicked, about salvation in Christ. And we have discussed something over a number of weeks that it is impossible for any of us to save anyone. And that it's also impossible for any of us to make someone believe the gospel. The only way a person can come to a saving knowledge of Christ is for God to reveal it to them. And we've read that in Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27, and also Matthew 16, 15 through 17. We know that unless God reveals salvation is through Christ alone, a person not only count, cannot, but will not believe. No, no, no manner of, uh, of arguing or scripture or debate or discussion can change that. Jesus, in John chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, you do not have to turn there, just kind of note it for yourself. Jesus says that unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, 
they won't see God. Now, water means natural, physical birth, and the spirit, <coughs> I have never done that that I can remember, sneeze while I was preaching. I apologize. But what we find is that a person must be born both physically and spiritually in order to see God. When a person is born, all of us, we are born spiritually dead and we experience a miracle of God that is equal to Jesus' resurrection from the dead. I'm going back over a few things that we have talked about because I need to lay us some groundwork. Our salvation, every one of us individually, is a God-wrought miracle beyond any other miracle that you will find in Scripture except Jesus' resurrection. Because in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, we are told, or Paul writes, that what happens in our salvation is the same power that it took to raise Jesus from the dead and seat him at the right hand of God. And so that's why it is important, it is essential, for God's intervention, and I pick that word specifically, into a person's life, in order for them to be saved. Do not overlook that. God has to intervene in a person's life in order for them to be saved. And that is why prayer is necessary in the salvation event. Look at Romans 10, 1 again. It says that his prayer for them is to be saved. Now, let's understand something very quickly. That God does not need us to save anybody. Okay? God can save without us. He's God. God also does not need us to pray for the lost in order for them to be saved. So what I want us to do is to understand from Romans 10, a couple other passages, is that God has chosen, let's get that, God has chosen to include us in his work of salvation by prayer or through prayer. He not only has chosen to use us through our prayers, but also our evangelization, evangelization in order for a person to be saved. Thus, Romans 10. Now from this point, we're gonna talk about something that I have neglected on a number of levels. I'm not gonna be too uh, confessional because it's none of y'all's business. <laughs> Just know that I am no different from you. And, and I, I heard a term this morning about situational praying. Do y'all know, know, know what that term may mean? Anybody? That we are primary situational prayers. That, that, that means for me is that something has to happen. And then I pray. Somebody gets sick. Well, then I pray. There is a tragedy. Well, then I pray. Somebody loses their job, well, then I pray for them. Whereas I'm not sure that that's the way we're supposed to be praying. In fact, this individual that I greatly respect said that probably about 95% of us are situational prayers. There are, you know, one of the things, I had a, a precious lady down in Montgomery, Alabama, Thelma McCain, um, was probably the most praying individual I have ever been around in my life. And she, I can remember one of the many things she said, sweetheart, sweetheart of a lady, is that she was glad that she was old and couldn't get out much. And I didn't understand it. And she said, because that gives me more time to pray. And I have been in, it's always been the ladies. I, I, I don't think that's, I, I visited one lady, um, 
think this might have been here in, in Muscle Shoals. No, 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 it was in um, Oxford. That showed me her bedroom. And next to her bedroom, she had two sets of folded towels about this long. And there were two impressions on those two towels sitting right next to her bed. And she said, that's where I pray every day. And I was amazed because everything else was pristine, beautiful, unique. But buddy, that, that, those towels over time had worn so that they, she said, it's almost like they call my knees. And she prayed. I want us to look at two things today about prayer. The first is how to pray for the lost. And then how to pray for others. In Romans 10, 1, Paul prayed for the Jews to be saved. That means that Paul asked God to give them what they did not have and could not have outside God's intervention and revelation. We know this from Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, where Paul wrote, By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. We have talked previously about how it in it is the gift of God is everything related to salvation. Faith, repentance, believing, all those things are gifts from God so that he gets the glory for salvation. For the lost to be saved, three things must happen. I'm not putting these in any particular order. Number one, there need to be prayers on their behalf. Romans 10, 1. Second, they've got to hear about Jesus. We're going to see that here in a couple of weeks with Romans 10. And then third, this is probably most important, God must grant them repentance, faith, and belief. Now, how long can that process of three things be? We don't know. It could be in the term of hours. It could be over the course of decades. It could even be after we have gone home to be with Jesus that God answers our prayers for a person to be saved after we die. When I got to thinking about this, Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. I did a lot of introspection just to be honest with you. And I got to thinking, who do I know that's not saved? Who do I know that doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, all those things. Who do I know that has no desire or interest in the things of God? Who do I know that never brings up God and Jesus in a conversation before I do? Who do I know that I'm not sure is saved? Because you see, if I really start thinking, and God has put me in those people's lives, which I think he has done for all of us, then depending on what I do will determine whether or not I have bloody hands. God has already told us what the end result is for those who are not saved. And God has told us in, in Ezekiel chapter 3, he says, let's back, let, let, Let's back up and go forward at the same time. We know what will happen to people who enter eternity without Christ. So we have that truth. Then we, as we're going to see in a minute, have been told, tell them. That's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Y'all remember that? Go ye therefore to all the nations, baptizing them, teach, uh, baptizing them, making disciples of all nations. I, 
I've messed up the quote on that. But we are told to be disciples, to tell the lost about Christ. And then we have to be praying for them. I, I would ask us all this morning, if you're writing anything down or taking notes, just write these three words, four words down. Who do I know? Who do I know? And then, not only who do you know, but if you and I want to make it into heaven without bloody hands, then we need to make some kind of effort. Look, I'm not saying you go into a deep theological discussion about eschatology and all those things. It could be something this simple. This simple is, is how you can wash the blood. Who was the Shakespearean person whose hands got bloody? Y'all remember? There was a Shakespearean person that they saw, thought they had blood on their hands and they kept trying to wash it off. One of y'all look it up on the internet and tell me later. But what we need to be thinking about is how to keep the blood off our hands. And here's how simple it can be. It is walking up to a person and saying, hey, can I tell you something that, that has happened to me that is the greatest thing ever? Sure. And then just tell them how God saved you. That is sharing the gospel. And who knows how God might use that. Maybe not then. Maybe you end up by saying, have you ever done that? Has God saved you? And, you know, there's no telling what they'll say, but it at least plants the seed. And I would suggest it gets the blood off our hands because we have shared the gospel. Now, let me go back to Romans 10.1 about how often do we ask God to reveal himself to them for salvation. Now, who are they? Who are they? Well, family, friends, neighbors, our children's future spouse, our grandchildren and their future, and their spouse, our community, and our nation. Now, I want us to all get a word out of our vocabulary. I want you to write it down. It's the word enough. I don't pray enough. Well, nobody prays enough. Get rid of that. Get rid of the word, of, uh, the word enough. However, I do want us to contemplate that we should be praying for these lost more than we do. I would even suggest that we make it public with our brothers and sisters here in this, in this setting to pray for the lost. And I guess that will happen when our hearts love them enough. Ooh, I just used that word, didn't I? <laughs> If we love somebody, we're going to tell them. If we don't care enough to tell a person about Christ and we believe them lost, what that means is, is we don't care if they go to hell. And I'm, look, everybody knows I'm a preacher, so that, that just makes mine worse than anybody else's. They expect it from me, and if I don't, then, you know, that's on me. So how serious am I? I'm going to make this for me from here on. How serious am I in my spirit and being that those whom I know that are lost will be saved? So here's a few elements about praying for those to be saved. Remember Romans 10.1. It's what we're looking at. My prayer for them is to be saved. First, we ask ourselves, and this is just a little quick, easy test. Who do we know that we're not sure is saved or believe them not to be saved? Number two, we must ask God to do his work for their salvation, like Paul did. Third, so far these are pretty easy. Third one may not be so easy, but it is easy. We just talked about it. We, you and I, must share the gospel with them doesn't mean you do it in a theological way that a Masters of Divinity or a THD does, but it means you share at least your own uh, salvation, your testimony. 
And then we must continue to pray for them till we die. Now that's what we do for those who are lost. That's what we do for those that do not know Christ. But that's not all I want to talk about this morning when it comes to prayer. I want us to shift gears a little bit. And I want you to turn to the book of Philippians. This is still going to be the, 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 the thought line of prayer. We're just going to change who it's about. When a person is saved, part of our family, maybe a friend, our prayer for them is different. And what I'd like to do is to look at how we are to pray for those who we know are saved, for those who we love, for our children, our grandchildren, their spouses, our friends. Our I want us to see how to pray for them. This comes from Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3. Now before I start reading this, I want to tell you this is probably the first time in a long time where I've had some serious issues about the scripture as I was reading it. And I had to stop and think through it for a, for a good amount of time, which means y'all may get out early. Hello? <laughs> no, I, 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 won't, I won't lie to you. We're going to stay late. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Philippians 1.3. Are y'all there now? Paul writes about the Philippians. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Now look at this. Slow down. Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm good to there. We've talked about Philippians 1, 6 often, about what God is going to make sure he accomplishes in the life of every believer. In other words, God is in control of this. He's going to do it. He will not let this part fail. That's why he says, I am sure of this. Skip down to verse 9 with me. To see how Paul prayed. Now remember, Paul already knows what God's going to do. And he's already written. He is going to accomplish these things. But right behind it, look what Paul prays. Verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Here's how a preacher's brain goes. This is when I got brain burn. If Paul believed Roman uh, Philippians 1 6, and he did, if Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write Philippians 1 6, and he did, then why does he need to pray what he prays in verses 9 through 11? Do you see my conundrum? Paul says this is what, what how does he says, I am sure of this. That he who began a good work in you, he, God, this is something God's doing. That he who began a good work in you will bring it, bring it to completion. In other words, there is no chance of it not happening. So why does Paul pray what he does in 9 through 11? Do you see where I kind of went, oh, wait a minute. Uh, Paul, if you, you're not making sense to me, Paul. You've got to help me out here because all of a sudden you are praying something that God's already said that he's going to do. So, why pray? If God is sovereign and if he is in control, 
And if he's going to do all the things that he says he's going to do, which we have talked about multiplicity of times, then why pray? If God is sovereign over all things, our prayers are meaningless, is the thought somehow. So let me give you a few things. Let me give you five reasons why we're to pray. It's going to be quick. It's going to be short. It's going to be easy. First of all, we're commanded to pray. <laughs> I mean, that's, what, that's pretty easy. Matthew 6, Jesus said, when you pray, and he said it three times in, in just a couple of verses. It is an expectation that God's people will pray. Number two, we're encouraged to pray. Encouraged to pray. Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and and grace and help in time of need. We're encouraged to pray. So we're commanded, we're encouraged. And then we have the example of Jesus. He prayed every time he turned around. He prayed at night, he prayed in, in the morning, he prayed during events, while he was walking, while he was uh, 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 doing miracles. I mean, Jesus prayed all the time. And if I want to be more like Jesus, I'm gonna pray Often, number four, God mysteriously works his will and we're somehow a part of it. Listen to Deuteronomy 29, 29. You've heard this before. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the words of his law. In other words, we don't know how God works. We know what he's told us. We know what he's commanded. And so we participate with God in what he's doing. But God doesn't tell us everything about what he's doing and why he's doing it. I can remember, I think this happens in every generation, that when a, a child is told to do something and they don't want to do it and they ask why, the parents, their, their, their last word, line of defense is, is this, because I said so. Well, parents got that from God. <laughs> he said, I want you to pray because that's how I work. Let me give you number five. God has chosen to save people in response to prayer. Turn to the book of Mark. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew chapter nine. <clears throat> In God, while you're going there, in God's divine secret wisdom, he has, chosen, he has chosen to save people as a result of his people praying. And he has chosen to mature people through the prayers of his people. Okay? And when we start reading here in Matthew chapter 9, you're going to be very familiar with this passage. It begins in verse 36. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 when Jesus saw the crowds thousands of people were, were following him all the time when Jesus saw the crowds he had compassion on them I love that I love that because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd then he, see, and this is interesting Jesus being the son of God could have gone and every bit of it taken away but he didn't. He didn't. Look at verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He could have very well even said, the need is so great, but there's no one going out to help them. So what does he say in verse 38? Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord. Get that. Don't lose that. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Jesus could have done it. He was the son of God. He could have snapped his fingers and taken care of every bit of it. But instead, Jesus said, my father and I have chosen to use you, his people, to be the ones that go out 
to those who are in need and to bless them, encourage them, share the gospel, save them and bring them into the faith. He said, that is the way God has chosen to work. Pray earnestly, verse 38, therefore, because the need is great, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We need to be praying for those who are in this community, who are in our families, who we work with, all of these people, for God to send people into their lives so that they can be told about the gospel so that they will have an opportunity so as to be saved. Can we at least care enough about, I'm talking to myself here, can I at least care enough about people, no matter what their background is, no matter what they kind of clothes they wear, no matter who their family, regardless, do we care enough to pray for their salvation? And if we can't talk to them about Christ, for God to put somebody into their life so that they will come to Jesus. That's what he's saying here. God uses our prayer to grow the kingdom. Wow. You take the number of people that we have here right now, and if we were to, for, for one year, for one, for one year, at each one of us ask God to use us to bring one person into the faith, we would double our attendance in one year. And that would be God doing it. If we were to just pray earnestly for those who are lost, for those who are wandering, and, and not worry about us, but care about, what did Jesus say? He leaves the 99 to do what? Number one. We know one. All of us know one. And I, I, I believe God has put us in their lives to pray, to share the gospel, so that they may be saved. And if they go to another congregation to worship, that's okay. That was a little jab at me, by the way. I'll tell you about it later. I got frustrated one time because there was some I'm not going to go too deep into it but they were attending where I was uh, pastoring and, and, and all of a sudden they quit coming and I asked about them and they said oh they went to another church and they got saved and I thought to myself God why didn't you save them here why didn't you save them under my preaching <laughs> and it's like God told me he said who do you think you are I saved people you ought to be celebrating for that and then I got up off the floor from being slapped down and went on from there would you mind turning to one last verse we'll get out early James you go to the right and if you get to 1 Peter you've gone too far okay because I want us to understand that when we pray we are accessing the almighty power of God who created the universe, who created this world, who brought everything into existence, who keeps our lungs breathing, our minds thinking, our eyes seeing, and our ears hearing, as it may be. Are you in, James? Did I tell you what chapter? Five. I know I haven't told you the verse, but by now you ought to be bird dogging it. You know what I mean? You ought to be saying, I know where he's going right now. Verse 17, for those that may yet wonder. James is talking, and notice what he does here. This is so interesting. This comes, by the way, from 1 Kings 17, 1 and 18, 1. <clears throat> James writes, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. You know what that means? He one of us for us to say I can't I'm not but you know I, somebody no he says James Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and look what happened and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and for three and a half years it did not rain then he prayed again heaven gave the rain and the earth bore its fruit 
Another passage real close in there says that the passionate and effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Hey guys, listen. When it comes to prayer, there is no PhD in prayer. As a child of God, we have access to the throne of God. And how cool would it be for us to be, as a result of prayer, to have a revival and awakening take place or to have a loved one of ours who does not know Christ come to salvation. I have seen one family celebrate over one conversion than at more than I have a church that celebrates over 50 because it's so personal. It's somebody, and, and you know how cool it is that when somebody comes to Christ, it's like the affirmation of the Holy Spirit of saying, you're walking in my will. That's a good thing. Good, good thing, good thing. So here's what I want us to do. This is so simple, so easy. When we go home, or as we're riding home, let one of the first discussions that you have with yourself or with your whoever, whoever's riding with you, uh, who, do we, who can we be praying for? And then, and then just start praying. All you have to do is say, God, God, reveal yourself to him, please. And give me the opportunity to share my testimony. And, and do you know how you know it's an opportunity to share your testimony? You are in their, you're in their presence. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will lead you with that. You know, you're not going to do it in the middle of Walmart unless God sends you an email or a text. I don't think God does that, but I do think you'll be prompted. And then who knows what we may see happen as a result of that. Do we want to see God move as a congregation? Because if we believe God, we will pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you confessing and admitting beginning with me that I have not shared the gospel as often as I could have. And that I need to pray more earnestly for there to be workers to go into the harvest. And then I need to pray more passionately for those whom I do not know of their salvation, that you would work in them so as to be saved. And not only be saved, but to worship with your people in a, a Christ setting. But God, we want you to be honored and glorified, and that happens every time a person is saved from damnation. God, encourage and strengthen us that we may be bold for your presence. In Christ's name, amen. Joel? 552. 552.